Thanks for uh, thanks for coming back. So um, <coughs> certainly, as I kind of wandered around the tables, there was a lot of really great um, discussion going on, and the fact that we had to extract you all at the times we needed you to move on was a really good sign that uh, there was lots of really good um, discussion going on. So. Um, We've got our panel of speakers. So David has had to go because he had to get a train um, now, in fact, um, down to Bristol. Um, so uh, Trudy and Dylan, you heard speak earlier. Just at the end there, I'd like to introduce Jenny uh, Lewis, who is uh, Director of Human Resources and Organisational Development at Leeds Teaching, uh, but also is the Joint Executive Lead for the Leeds Health and Care Academy. So, Jenny, thank you for agreeing to join join um, the panel. So, um, there were five uh, tables that uh, you've hopefully had chance to be on. On three of them, um, John Cooper, uh, Julie Sutcliffe, uh, Ruth Burnett, Alistair Walling, and Mike Curtis, who've all very kindly uh, still been able to be with us. So, what I'd like to do to start with is perhaps. <laughs> for each of you just to give us a little bit of feedback from your tables, just two or three bullet points about the kind of themes that came up, if you can. And then we'll, we'll move into uh, uh, asking uh, the panel to uh, perhaps comment on some of those themes that have emerged and we'll then open it out uh, into a Q&A session, particularly I'm excited about because we've got this microphone that you throw around the room. So that, that's, so that sounds very exciting. So who, um, who wants to kick off? Uh, on table one. I can, I can Thank you, John. So table one is about um, retaining and, uh, and, and attracting people to the workforce. And I think um, what was really interesting was that the, the Discussion evolved over time, um, and and no two no no table was the same. But I think the themes that were were sort of um, that resonated with all of the, the 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 table discussions were really about that flexibility that comes through again in terms of working and whether or not that was less than full time. It was about career um, flexibility of not being stuck to a rigid program. Um, I think one of the major things that came through was also signposting careers and that was particularly at an undergraduate level of knowing what was out there and what was possible um, and and that joined up thinking of wider workforce uh, systems working together and, and the final theme that was um, linked was really role modeling and mentorship throughout throughout training so I think um, that's they're, they're, they're the themes that we developed. Great thank you John. Um, who Oh, we'll go in table order. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. Right, so I, I was um, table two, and, and the theme of our discussion was around improving working lives for our future medical workforce. Um, I think what was quite interesting was that we had three very, very different discussions um, for each of the sessions, um, although there were some, some recurrent themes running through them. So the, fir the first... Um, the group wanted to talk um, quite a lot around um, system in interoperability and standardisation and the lack of interoperability and standardisation and having to learn and log on to multiple systems, um, not only as they move around the system, but also with, within individual trusts and um, how it would improve their working lives if they could have systems that spoke to one another. Um, and that included um, things, uh, the clinical systems and support for education and training. Um, the second group, um, there was a, um, a sort of a thread around culture and morale and, and a feel that um, there's a lack of camaraderie and how can we, how can we recapture that and how can we um, create a, 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 a culture of positivity where um, there's praise and, and recognition. Um, and then thirdly, I think we really focused on the, the transition from being a medical student to a foundation trainee 
and how challenging that can be and how um, in terms of your confidence it can you know you can have a real um, confidence crisis when you've one, one girl described the, sorts of the analogy from moving from primary school to, to secondary school that you're suddenly back again in you know you're, you're the small fish in the great big pond um, and they talked around respect um, and um, them a fear really of raising concerns and exception reporting and what we could do to support that in the future. Okay, great. Thank you, Gina. Mike. Shall I uh, break it up by going to five? Uh, so, uh, uh, Mike Curtis, I uh, hosted the discussion around inclusivity and diversity. And if I can just uh, share with you a couple of um, observations, you know, what I'm taking, what I'm personally taking from but is it the student view or the outside, the view of somebody looking ahead, the importance of um, stereotypes and role model role models. Uh, they can be uh, on the plus, the draw of a fantastic role model and how important that can be. And we, we heard lots of examples of of great role models uh, and how that's inspired people and shaped uh, decisions that people are making about their future career. The um, the sense of the, the quote that was given to me, you know, if you can see it, you can be it. That sense and how, how important that is. On the other hand, the stereotype, uh, uh, how that it can work negatively against it um, and uh, uh, the importance of that. And um, one of the comments, if the over, you know, comments overheard in the hospital, well, uh, she doesn't look like a surgeon. Uh, and that sense that uh, uh, um, still... The surgery still seems to be one area where uh, women are keeping away from, for whatever reason. There's lots of progress in lots of areas, but there seems to be one area. And that, that came out in, uh, in two of the three conversations we had. So uh, thank you. I learned a lot. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thanks. <laughs> um, thanks. So, yeah, I'm Alice Dorling. I was leading the Developing a Digital Savvy Future Workforce, and it was a really interesting kind of set of tables. We had different discussions, but there were some very clear running themes. The first was zero uh, training, pretty much, on the use of digital tools in healthcare through all different aspects, either in just the basics. So what people talked about now, when they talked about things, it was about using clinical systems. There was a lot of kind of understanding of that. There was mixed exposure. There were some really good cases of where they'd had excellent training in placements on the clinical system and had it used in a really effective way. That seemed to be reflected by an organisation that used it themselves in a really effective way. And there were other examples of where none of the student logins worked and so therefore they couldn't use it even though they'd had an aspect of training. But actually looking beyond that and beyond that kind of aspect, there was there were some individual examples where people had sought out external opportunities, sought out their own personal interests and done some really interesting stuff around digital innovation, change management and some of the tools looking for that, but very little through their core kind of training at all. And and in some cases, I think perhaps a lack of thought around some of those aspects, um, both in changing <laughs> the system as a whole and the understanding of that, and also in those digital tools. And then there were, again, a quite a big mix of how it might affect things going forwards, both from the conventional medical models, but the use of things like AI, the use of digital support tools. And, and in some ways, I think there, was, there wasn't that awareness. There was, it was interesting that most, the, there was a very high level of confidence in using tech and digital in their experiences in the rest of the world. And they believed they would be all right with it as they came to some of that stuff. Although there was a desire for a uniform system across the health system. Um, but I think actually looking at that, thinking forwards, I think we need to encourage, we need to look at how we get people thinking about what things could be coming and how it might change stuff. Thank you, Alistair. Ruth. Hi there, I'm Ruth. Um, so I was talking about developing system leaders um, and collaborative working. So like the others, we had some quite different discussions, but there were some very, very clear key themes that came out. Um, similarly, you could actually go through your medical training and just learn to become an F1. And that that's what it felt like training was uh, designed to do, was it taught you to become a junior doctor. It didn't teach you beyond that. that um, but similarly, 
the people that had done intercalated degrees, the people that had gone off and done um, placements that they'd sought out, had some fantastic experiences of learning about systems leadership. Uh, I'm sure Ian paid half my table, but I heard a lot about the module on healthcare systems in the public health <laughs> intercalated degree. Um, in all seriousness though, that came up more than once and the benefits of that perhaps being brought into the wider training programme to increase people's awareness. Um, there was also talk about learning with other professions, um, crossing over more the value that's learnt from the people that, that take jobs as HCAs in the holidays. And, and there was some learning from East Anglia where they have IPL opportunities with the other professions. So they do OSCEs with pharmacists um, and things like that, which I thought was fantastic. Um, and this sort of feeling that we could do more as a system to formally make some opportunities available, whether that's um, those of us in the system offering mentoring, offering short placements, offering opportunities to maybe even spend a day with somebody from, say, an engineering degree to, to look at a question. Um, but also, I think quite fundamentally, most people felt they'd never really experienced leadership. Um, and so perhaps even just consciously exposing people on their individual placements to conscious leadership so every placement they go on, there will be leadership, but they're not seeing it. Um, so there were loads of ideas. And, and even though there are obviously some frustrations within the system, I think one of the key points I took away was that, that training has significantly changed for the better because they talked in a way and that I don't think I could have talked at that stage of medical school about systems um, and about quality improvement and things like that. So I, I do think we're doing something right, but I think there's more that we can do. Great. Okay. Thank you to all the tables for that. So I'm conscious of time and I do want to get the kind of vo voice of the room. So maybe um, Trudy, Dylan, Jenny, we could have kind of one sound bite on what you've heard uh, and then perhaps throw it open to the floor if that's all right. Um, so I would say, wow, um, what's been so powerful for me today, the Leeds Health and Care Academy um, that has arranged this big conversation is something that we want to um, nurture and invest in. And its core purpose is to do everything that you have all just fed back that this room is is desiring. So in terms of your strong desire to understand the narrow breadth of specialis specialisms, but also to understand the breadth of care, not just inside, but outside of the NHS, and to be able to innovate and use technology and to be able to work with other professions um, and for us to have the ability to be able to either supplement or impact curriculum in order that it fulfills the things that you've been telling us this afternoon you need. I'm over the moon that those two things are congruent. Um, so I heard a bit of, so where will this conversation go? So I think we just need to think about how we continue to get the, vo we're the voice of um, our early years learners. We want to, the academy to work all the way across lifelong learning. Um, but I've heard so many powerful requirements today. We will continue to involve you in the development of that initiative. Yeah, uh, the two things that really came out to me was that uh, it's really important when we talk about digitally savvy and all of these things to make it relevant to the person themselves and their own context and what they want. So I don't think it is a one size fits all. People have got different desires in where they want to get to. So I think I think it's about individualizing and targeting some, some of that. Uh, I think the other thing is as well is that uh, it's clear to me not being in the NHS, but coming into the NHS only in the last five or six years, the NHS is very hierarchical. Now, that might be for good reason, but I'm conscious of the fact that it seems that juniors are slapped down a lot. So uh, I just think it seems to me that 
some of the people in this room might have better ideas in ways in which we need to change the system. Maybe you should be uh, listened to and given the opportunity to, to bring those points of view forward because in my field, they're probably a lot more digitally savvy than maybe the lead consultant or whatever. So uh, that's that's uh, what I'd reflect from some of the feedback. Thank you, Dylan. So I think what I've uh, heard today is a great move from students being passive recipients of education to being active participants in their education. And uh, for those of you who, um, uh, like me, uh, uh, Charles Dickens fan, uh, fans, I would really uh, recommend you read just chapter one of Hard Times. Just chapter one, the rest of it's pretty tedious, but uh, <laughs> uh, chapter one, and, and one thing about Dickens is he's very graphic with his uh, name. So the teacher, it's in a school, there's a teacher there, and the teacher's called Mr. Machokum Child. And all the students there are described as little sitting there like little empty vessels to be filled up with facts all the time. And I think that, you know, in the past, medicine was a bit like that, filled up with facts, learn all these facts, 15 causes of atrial fibrillation and re, re, reproduce this in an exam and you'll be fine. And of course, you, you, if you could, you weren't fine. And it was a, it was a, a very difficult, a, a different experience. But now what I'm seeing, and I think this is great, is that students are becoming active partners in their education. And it's challenging. Uh, but it's great, and I think that that will be for all for the better in the future. So, if you, if, if I, that's what I've taken from it. If I get you to do one thing, just read chapter one of Hard Times, <laughs> and I'll take a commission from all those books that people are buying. <laughs> okay, thanks very much, Trudy. So, okay, let's op open it out to um, to questions from anybody. If you if you want to ask uh, any of the panel, or indeed any of the um, table leads, a question. Please do. Uh, we've got this uh, floating um, catch mic thing. Um, so, Testing my netball um, skills now. <laughs> if you want to ask, if you if you want to ask a question, just let us uh, just tell us who you are, if you wouldn't mind, so that we uh, can get to know each other better in the ring. <laughs> It's the future. Uh, okay, thank you very much for being here and for the discussions. I do feel that a lot of what we mentioned at the tables or otherwise was very theoretical. It was a very utopian or rather a dystopian world where, you know, we've got these flawless medical technologies, AI, robots and stuff like that was being mentioned. My question to you really, <clears throat> the three of you is, within your areas of interest, how do we sort of develop medical students from an educational point of view, from a curriculum point of view, in order to prepare them for the skills they will need, say in 2030, where we do have a streamlined system, where we do have, uh, where we've applied AI into our work and so on and so forth, because none of this will take place in the NHS without students having the necessary skills from the get-go. And I think in order to paint the beautiful pictures that we have at the moment, we'll need to start working on a mass level. So what do we need to do? What kind of seeds do we need to plant in order to reach this stage? <coughs> well, shall I start with that? I, I mean, I think that's a very difficult question, as I say. We, we can't, you know, actually thinking what the health service will be like after the 13th of uh, December is going to be challenging, I think, really, at this point in time. Um, so, uh, yeah, and, and I mean, three years ago, I mean, and Dylan will know more about this than I do, there's a chap called Geoffrey Hinton, who, um, uh, who's an AI expert, who said, we should not be training any more radio radiologists because in five years' time, it'll all be done by machine and AI. Well, the, the effect on the, uh, no, no radiologist has been sacked because of that, uh, because of that statement. And in fact, AI is pr proving to be much more difficult to train in terms of radiography mm. than, than we thought. And of course, statements like that can mean, you might think to yourself, I'm not going to be a radiographer, a radiologist, because there won't be any jobs. So we've got to be very careful. And there was what was called the genomic winter, when the promise of genomics was so great and then it stalled. So we've got to be very careful. So I would say that the skills that we need to equip you with are things like problem solving, critical thinking, embracing change, being uh, agile, being you know, flexible and things like that, because those skills will not change. 
You'll always need those skills. But the specific skills uh, in 10 years' time that a surgeon might need are going to be very difficult to predict. So going back, I mean, the dean's still here, and I'm quite clean to, to tease him even more, is if now we're going to handheld ultrasound for uh, listening to the chest, for looking at the, visualizing the heart and things like that, when should I stop teaching you auscultation? Now, okay? That would cause panic amongst people like the Dean who um, wouldn't like that, despite the fact he's never used his stethoscope in 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> but, so, but you see what I mean? It's difficult. And then people say to me, well, what if you were on a desert island? You wouldn't have an ultrasound machine. Would you? You're on a desert island. Who the hell's going to listen to somebody's chest? You know, they're not going to. But you can see what we're up against. But it is this difficult about knowing you what stop one thing and pick up something else. And uh, so that's why on the total review, those top 10 uh, technologies were quite interesting, and those were by experts in the field. But they're going to be wrong at least on about half of those, I guess. So I don't have the answer, uh, I'm afraid. Yeah, I mean, what I was going to say was, well, you tell me. Because I think uh, it's a similar, similar thing, really, the sort of skills in terms of critical thinking and all of that. I think, you, you know, you guys have got to be involved in how we shape, how that future is going to be. You know, you can't leave it to the technologists because that's what tends to happen and then it is it is done to you so uh so i think yeah i mean it's it's those generic skills that trudy picked up on um uh, mine might be a little um a little different so i stepped out of uh healthcare into a different part of the public sector for quite some years and have only just come back to it and we're having a conversation in this room now that I had 10 years ago about the widening out of what it means to be a leader in a system of health and care. Um, so I think we'd identified the things that you talked about on your tables today needing. I was part of a conversation 10 years ago around that. So. My observation is we've got to grasp those issues of working across boundaries, broadening out your exposure from um, narrow specialism into what it genuinely means to provide care across the system of leads. And we've got a real opportunity to do that now. We've managed for the last 10 years without it. I would hope that we don't manage the next 10 years without it. Okay, who, any question? You can throw it, go on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, firstly, I just wanted to say thank you for the opportunity to have students here um, to share our opinions and also contribute in this massive discussion because I think sometimes it's very easy to just feel like we're talking and you know people ask questions at the end of lectures and stuff but this has been curated to actually gauge our opinions which is um which I'm quite grateful for so thank you um as I'm sat here I'm thinking about the next few months entering work um and I wonder and obviously coming to events like this and um having opportunities to discuss future problems and how can, you know, different forces tackle them. I, I, I don't know if my colleagues feel the same, but I sort of have an image of entering working, you know, having more access or being more vigilant of the problems that exist. Um, and then I'm wondering, maybe we're all here because we all have sort of ambitions to be leaders um, where we work, but what happens to the rest of my colleagues, what happens to the rest of the, the workforce, if you like, um, is there efforts or are there efforts, sorry, um, to sort of empower everyone to feel as though, to feel prepared to tackle problems um, in their workplace without an event? Does this make sense? Mm -hmm. So um, is, is there, are there efforts or, or is there anything that has been done or can be done to make pretty much every medical student feel as though if there is a problem, <laughs> they are equipped to, to work towards solving them or raising them at the very least. Can I pick that up? Um, so one of the things we've been piloting for the last year is to bring together, I'll call them practitioners, um, 
from a range of health care, third sector, volunteers, um, to learn together, to understand what it means to get things done across organisational boundaries. And that's been primarily about getting people together in a room to talk about the stories that they have taken the initiative around that has worked across boundaries, that's not <coughs> been easy for them to do, but has usually had a person at the centre of it. They've done the right thing. And we've said we need to just enable people to be able to do more of that as we try to break down the barriers or the silos between the way that we are all organised. So one of the things I've made a note for today, I'm delighted about the conversation we've had today. As I've said to you before, it's so congruent with the aims and ambitions of the Leeds Health and Care Academy. And somebody in the room today said to me, this is what the Academy is meant to be doing. So you've brought the purpose of the Academy through your conversation with us today to life. There's the real opportunity for us to just say to all of um, medical students, we'll enrol you as part of that two day programme to experience what it means to work with people from a variety of professions right across Leeds. Um, and that's something that we ought to be able to pick up fairly easily. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Let's just one from here. <laughs> so much fun. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, so I want to reiterate everyone's thanks as well because it's quite inspiring to be able to see people, you know, where potentially some of us might be further on in our career. Um, kind of somewhat adding to your question, um, is the idea that every medical student will have the critical appraisal, problem solving skills to tackle these kinds of problems. And if so, I would argue that the way of teaching problem solving for these kind of problems is different from teaching patient comes in with X, Y, and Z, what are you going to do? And how, how are we going to make it so that actually the whole student workforce has those skills? I mean, this is more opinion than fact but uh I, I think my view would be where you can get a lot of learning is looking at other verticals so actually uh you know it might be said that healthcare might be behind many other verticals for all sorts of reasons so certainly from a digital perspective is looking at what's happening in automotive or what's happening in industry so things for instance there's the concept of digital digital twins whereby through data you can replicate what happens on a pump or whatever and then do scenarios of what might happen in the future. In a similar vein, there are ideas that you could do the same with, you know, how, how particular organs will generate or whatever. So, you know, for, for me, it, I would be looking at other industries and seeing what's transferable. That, but that's, that's opinion rather than what we're going to do. Um. I think we've got to be a bit careful here because uh, just to go back to Fumi's point is you are different. The people who are medical students here are somewhat different because you have chosen to come here and you have chosen to take part in this. Now, is that the same for all the 280 people? Uh, it's not going to be, is it? It's going to be a different thing. On the other hand, going back to your point, I think everybody, every medical student is going to need problem solving skills because they're, go they're going to actually encounter those in their everyday work. So yes. So what I put back to you then, because I don't know this and, uh, you know, my time is limited now on this earth, uh, is that um, what am I going to take out of the medical curriculum? Five years when you start medical school seems an awful long time. And now you're in year five and it's gone like a flash. Each one of those weeks has been filled to the top. So if I put more things in, like more problem solving skills, not related to patients, but to other things, systems and so forth, what am I going to take out? 
I'll take out anatomy, won't I? Yeah, because who can needs I, that can these I days? Back? Who's, who needs that? We'll take out legs. We'll just do. <laughs> we'll leave legs alone or something. No, but but, but see, radiology. Yeah. yeah. So you know, do you see what I mean? There is. A, we, yeah. we have. A, a, we've got to actually think. You can't keep putting things in. We can't keep bolting things in. What comes out? And nobody wants their bit to come out. I've never met anybody who says, yeah, you can take my subject out. It's fine. No, that's fine. They don't need to know anything about me. They don't need to know anything about immunology. <laughs> but, then, so. but then I guess, is it more not about taking something out, but more about adding in an extra question while you're looking at that scenario of the person that's coming and got CPD and looking at smoking and actually saying, so what do we think their home life's Still like? Time. Still time. Yes, you can do that because you can link those onto things. Mm -hmm. And that's what case-based learning does. But it still takes time. True. Phil six. Okay. There's a question at the back there. You have to catch, you can't speak without catching the mic. Oh, are you ready? <laughs> just, fo just following on from your point there, Trudy. Um, I know in the first and second year, there's the ideals module. And I think the intent we were discussing, actually, I think the intention of that is very, very good. And I think that's kind of the beginning of something that could snowball into something much more valuable. Um, and I think in terms of, challenging that whole we can't take things out i think by adapting that module to incorporate some more leadership things because there's my perspective on it from what i learned there was a lot of theory about teamwork a lot of theory about leadership de bono hats etc cetera, etc cetera, but there wasn't a huge amount of pragmatic kind of practical application of that so i wonder whether it's just to um just be beneficial to kind of really look at that and, and mold that I'm mean, sure. I, I don't want to get into detail now because I think that's not you know so interesting for other people. Um, but I think you're absolutely right. I think we make a big play about leadership when you when your personal statement and when you come to the MMIs, and then we don't we don't actually live that uh, walk that uh, walk afterwards for a couple of years. So I think you you make a very good point. Okay. Sorry, Jason. You just wanted to come in quickly. Well, that's a big throw. <laughs> that's a big throw. Go for it. Oh, well done, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Jason Ward and the programme lead for the MBCHB programme. So just a few thoughts. I think we're clearly doing something right um, in terms of the many things that you already do. So in terms of um, feeling, are you prepared? Clearly lots of you are. So these nice examples in the room of students developing apps, developing podcasts for our, for our well-being restart a heart campaign and educating the public how to do CPR. So I think there's huge amounts um, of great work that you're already doing as students. So clearly you've got some of those skills. Um, to pick up the ideals point, I think you're absolutely right. We've just appointed a new lead for ideals. Um, and I think it almost needs flipping on its head that we're probably teaching you about medical leadership in years one and two when you don't have clinical experience of it. It's quite academic, as you say, it's quite theoretical. Actually, seeing that in years four and five, when you're in primary care, community care, secondary care, you have much better experience because you can draw on the things you're seeing. So um, that bit's underway. Um, and the final bit, I just wanted to reassure you, all these worries about transition from year five to foundation year, um, things will happen at the end of year five that will help with that transition. Um, and we work closely with LTHT and the trust you're going to be going into. And the foundation year doctors tell us actually they're more prepared than they think you're going to be. So don't worry too much. We'll never get it quite right because it is a it is a transition, um, but there are things. So don't don't worry too much. Okay, thanks, Jason. So we are actually over time. So is there any? I'm sure panel members and other colleagues will be around um, after this. Is there any one last pressing question anybody wants to ask in the formal? setting as i say though i'm sure there'll be opportunities to carry on these conversations after that is anyone else struggling to remember 15 causes of hate <laughs> <laughs> so uh, i don't think the dean is because you know i've just looked it up on my, uh, on my app you can always google it because yeah. <laughs> Okay, so um, could I just remind people that you can continue the conversation on Twitter with the hashtag Future Med Workforce as well, if anybody wants to ask any questions there. Okay, so um, just to kind of draw draw things to a close, thanks 
again everybody for coming and contributing it seems to me it's been a really lively and kind of refreshing session where everybody's felt they've had an opportunity um, to contribute it is the first of these we are doing there will be some feedback forms outside on the table so kind of give us your critical feedback because we can only make these events better by by getting that um, i think we had three Great talks at the beginning from um, from Trudy, from Dylan, and from Sir David, uh, outlining I think the challenges and opportunities of technology and how the workforce will need to kind of both adapt but also shape that use of technology. And I think we got that message back from 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 you as a as a as a student doctor group as well. Um, I guess for me, I, I, uh, the Vox Pops video is a real highlight of the day for me. I just thought it was really uh, great and. Thanks again. I know there's some of you in the room. I'm not going to pick you out, but I now recognise some of the faces on there. Um, so thanks again for, for doing that and being so candid and honest about, about, about your aspirations and, and your, your kind of wishes for, for the future. Uh, I think the, the round table discussion seemed uh, animated and lively. We had to prize people away, which is always quite a good sign. Um, and I think we just had a really good and fruitful discussion there, highlighting some of the themes that you talked about and some really helpful discussion with panel members. Um, so I'm just going to hand over to, to Ross now to, to, to wrap up. Thanks, Ross. Um, so the sort of phrase, fake it till you make it, seems to ring true here. So here I am faking it still. Um, so thank you very much to Leeds Health Academy for hosting. Um, and we'll show a video just after I've uh, thanked the others, um, which so hopefully sort of consolidates the concept of what that is and inspires you to uh, get involved with them. Um, thank you to the studio who are filming um, and to Nexus for hosting us in this beautiful venue um, and for KPMG for the drinks and uh, snacks available afterwards. So please stick around. Um, thank you to Lime for supporting us and getting me involved as well. Um, James Nicholson was also involved from a student point of view, but he couldn't be here. He's in Plymouth. Um, thank you very much to the keynote speakers uh, and Sir David, who's left. Um, your input's been really insightful and quite inspiring from my point of view. Um, and thanks to the hosts as well. Um, these are people in really powerful positions that we students need to network with. Um, these are the enablers who can open doors for us. We are the activators who can then push these ideas forward. So please learn from what you've um, discussed today and act on it. So this is a bit of a call to action to actually do something about the lessons we've learned today. Um, otherwise, thank you to the exhibitors for also supporting the event. Um, please stick around, have some discussions with people who are quite scary to go and introduce yourself to once you're in there. Um, yeah, it's all, it's all worth it. Okay, thank you very much.